Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have two hours of scary stories. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's see if we can reach 750 likes on this one. I know that's a pretty high like goal, but if you feel that this video is deserving of it, let's see if we can get there. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this all of the time. Anyways, sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I've always loved kids and thought babysitting would be an easy way to earn some extra money while studying for my degree. When Mrs. Thompson called me out of the blue and asked if I could watch her two children, Lily and Max, for a few hours one evening, I didn't hesitate to say yes. She offered an incredible hourly rate and assured me that the kids were well behaved. The job seemed like a dream come true. The evening started off normally enough. I arrived at the Thompsons' home, a large old house on the outskirts of town and was greeted by Mrs. Thompson, a pleasant woman in her mid-forties. She introduced me to Lily, a sweet five-year-old with curly blonde hair, and Max, a quiet seven-year-old who seemed a bit shy. After a brief tour of the house, Mrs. Thompson handed me a list of rules and instructions. She looked at me with an intensity that made me uneasy. These rules are very important, Hannah she said. Please follow them exactly. I nodded, taking the list from her. Of course, Mrs. Thompson. I will. She smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Thank you. We'll be back around midnight. With that, she and Mr. Thompson left, and I was alone with the kids. I glanced at the list of rules, feeling a little silly. How hard could it be to babysit for a few hours? 1. Always keep the doors and windows locked. No problem. It was an old house and I figured they just wanted to be safe. 2. Do not let the children play outside after dark. Fair enough. It was already evening and the yard was surrounded by dense woods. 3. Do not answer the phone unless it rings twice in quick succession. A bit odd, but okay. 4. Bedtime is at 8 p.m. No exceptions. That seemed reasonable. 5. If you hear whispering, ignore it. Do not investigate. That one made me pause. What kind of whispering? But I shrugged it off as overprotective parenting. 6. If Lily starts singing, do not interrupt her. Wait until she finishes. Lily was humming to herself as she played with her dolls. It seemed harmless enough. 7. If Max asks you about the shadows, distract him immediately. Creepy, but probably just a way to keep his overactive imagination in check. 8. Under no circumstances should you go into the basement. That was fine with me. I hate basements. I put the list aside and joined the kids in the living room. They were watching a cartoon, and everything seemed perfectly normal. After a while, I made them dinner and helped them get ready for bed. As the clock struck eight, I tucked them in, read them a story, and turned off the lights. Good night, Hannah. Lily whispered, her voice soft and sweet. Good night, Lily. Good night, Max. I replied, closing the door gently behind me. I went back downstairs and settled onto the couch with a book. The house was quiet, the only sound the ticking of the grandfather clock in the hallway. It was peaceful, almost too peaceful. Around 9 o'clock, the phone rang once, then twice in quick succession. Remembering the rule, I picked it up. Hello? Hannah, it's Mrs. Thompson. How are things going? Everything's fine, I replied, glancing around the room. 
The kids are asleep and everything's quiet. Good, she said, sounding relieved. Remember to follow the rules and everything will be fine. Of course, I said, trying to sound confident. After we hung up, I went back to my book, but my mind kept drifting off to the rules. What did they mean by whispering, and why couldn't Max talk about shadows? Suddenly I heard a faint sound coming from upstairs. It was like a soft, rhythmic chanting. My heart skipped a beat as I realized it was Lily singing. Remembering the rule, I stayed where I was, listening to her song. It was a haunting melody, and it sent chills down my spine. She sang for what felt like an eternity before finally falling silent. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. This was ridiculous. It was just a song, but the house felt different now, like the air was thicker, heavier. A few minutes later, I heard another sound, and this time it was from the hallway. It was a soft, whispering noise, just barely audible. I strained to hear what it was saying, but I couldn't make out any words. My first instinct was to get up and check on the kids, but the rule echoed in my mind. If you hear whispering, ignore it. I stayed on the couch, my heart pounding. The whispering grew louder, more insistent. It felt like it was coming from right behind me, but I forced myself to stay put. After a few agonizing minutes, it stopped. The house was silent again, but the sense of unease lingered. Then I heard footsteps on the stairs. Slow, deliberate footsteps, coming down one step at a time. I turned toward the sound, my breath catching in my throat. Max appeared at the bottom of the stairs, his eyes wide and frightened. Hannah? He whispered. The shadows are moving. I remembered the rule and quickly stood up. Hey Max, do you want some hot chocolate? Let's go to the kitchen. He nodded, his eyes darting around the room as if he was afraid something might jump out at him. I took his hand and led him to the kitchen, trying to keep my voice light and cheerful. Do you like marshmallows in your hot chocolate? I asked, hoping to distract him. He nodded again, but his grip on my hand tightened. I made us both a cup of hot chocolate, and we sat at the kitchen table. Max kept glancing over his shoulder, his fear palpable. Max, what did you see? I asked gently, trying to keep my own fear at bay. The shadows, he whispered. They're watching us. A shiver ran down my spine. It's okay, Max. You're safe here. He shook his head. They're everywhere. They want to take us. I don't know what to say. I tried to reassure him, but his fear was contagious. I decided it was best to put him back to bed and hoped he would fall asleep quickly. As we walked back up the stairs, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I talked Max back into bed and stayed with him until his eyes finally closed. As I turned to leave the room, I caught a glimpse of movement in the hallway. My heart leaped into my throat, but when I looked again, there was nothing there. Back in the living room, I paced nervously, my mind racing. This job was turning out to be far more than I had bargained for. The rules, the whispering, the shadows. It all felt like something out of a nightmare. At around 11.30, the phone rang again, twice in quick succession. I answered it with a trembling hand. Hannah, it's Mrs. Thompson. Is everything okay? Uh, I'm not sure, I admitted. Max was talking about shadows, and there's been strange noises. Just follow the rules, Hannah she said firmly. We'll be home soon. She hung up before I could say anything else. I set the phone down, my hands shaking. What was going on in this house? A sudden noise from the basement made me jump. It was a soft, rhythmic thumping, like someone knocking on a door. The rule about the basement flashed through my mind. 
Under no circumstances should you go into the basement. I wanted to ignore it, to pretend I hadn't heard anything, but the sound was persistent. I took a deep breath, trying to muster my courage. Maybe it was just a loose pipe or an old furnace acting up. As I stood there debating what to do, the knocking grew louder, more insistent. Against my better judgment, I found myself moving toward the basement door. My hand trembled as I reached for the doorknob. Just as I was about to turn it, a voice behind me made me freeze. Hannah, don't. I spun around to see Max standing at the top of the stairs, his eyes wide with fear. Go back to bed, Max. I said, my voice shaking. Please, don't open the door. He whispered, they'll get out. My heart pounded in my chest. Who will get out? The shadows, he said, his voice barely audible. They're trapped down there. If you open the door, they'll come for us. The fear in his voice convinced me to step back. I guided Max to his room and tucked him in once more, promising him that I wouldn't open the basement door. Back in the living room, I sat on the couch, my mind racing. The knocking continued, but I forced myself to ignore it. Whatever was down there, I didn't want to find out. Finally, just before midnight, the front door opened and Mrs. Thompson walked in, followed by her husband. Relief washed over me at the sight of them. How was everything? She asked, her eyes scanning the room. It was... Eventful, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. She nodded as if she expected that answer. Thank you, Hannah. You did well. I gathered my things and headed for the door, eager to leave the house and its unsettling secrets behind. As I stepped outside, Mrs. Thompson's voice stopped me. One last thing, Hannah. I turned to look at her. Yes? Never speak of what happened here tonight, for your own sake. I nodded, too shaken to argue, and left the house. The drive home was a blur. My mind was filled with thoughts of shadows, whispers, and the rules I had barely understood. As I lay in bed that night, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had followed me home. The darkness in my room seemed thicker, more oppressive. I kept the lights on, unable to sleep, haunted by the events of the evening. The next morning, I woke up with deep, dark circles under my eyes. Despite barely sleeping, as I dragged myself to the bathroom, I noticed something odd in the mirror. There were faint, shadowy figures flickering behind me. I turned around quickly, but there was nothing there. I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination, a remnant of the night's terror. Over the following days, the occurrences escalated. I could see fleeting shadows out of the corner of my eye, hear whispering voices when I was alone, and feel a chilling presence in my room at night. My grades started to slip and I found it hard to concentrate on anything. Friends noticed the change in me, commenting on how tired and distracted I seemed. One night, as I was studying for an important exam, the power went out. I sat in the dark, trying to steady my breathing, when I heard the familiar whispering. It was louder now, almost as if it was inside my head. I clutched my ears and squeezed my eyes shut, but it didn't stop. Suddenly a cold hand grabbed my ankle, pulling me off my chair. I screamed and kicked, but there was nothing to fight against. The whispers turned into menacing growls, and the shadowy figures closed in around me. Just as quickly as it started, the power came back on and the shadows vanished. But the fear remained, a constant reminder that I was never truly alone. I knew that the shadows had followed me home. They were here to stay. No matter where I went, I could feel their presence lurking in the corners, watching and waiting. 
The babysitting job that seemed like a dream had turned into a never-ending nightmare. Desperate for a solution, I contacted Mrs. Thompson, hoping she could help me banish the shadows. She listened to my plight with a knowing expression and then reluctantly gave me a small, worn book titled Wardings Against the Dark. She explained that it contained rituals and protections that might help me rid myself of the shadows. I spent the next few nights carefully following the instructions in the book. I lit candles, burned herbs, and recited incantations. Each night the presence of the shadows seemed to weaken. On the third night, after completing the final ritual, I felt an overwhelming sense of relief as the shadows dissipated, leaving my room feeling lighter and more peaceful. Although the immediate threat was gone, the experience had left a permanent mark on me. I no longer took safety for granted, and always followed the rules Mrs. Thompson had given me, even in my own home. I never took another babysitting job, and the memory of that night stayed with me, a constant reminder of the things that lurk in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to strike. The true horror had just begun. And it was far from over, but at least, for now, I had found a way to keep the darkness at bay. It's something she's been doing for as long as we have rented this house together. When she is sleeping, normally in her deepest sleep, I've noticed she itches and scratches like there are bugs creeping between the hairs of her skin. Some days she wakes up with freshly scabbed scratch marks where she dug in too deep. Typically, I try and hold her hands before bed just to stop her from scratching, but I tend to get antsy when she falls asleep and I end up reading for a bit until I can doze off. Lately, it's been like insomnia maybe due to anticipation of change. We have definitely been coming towards a turning point in our lives as our lease is ending. We have been sorting out what to sell and give away furniture wise because we are moving out west and won't be bringing much with us. I collected everything else I could think of that would be worthwhile with the intention of hitting a few pawn shops to see what I could get in return. I had some baseball cards and a PlayStation I never used. I even listed my TV for a great price online and got rid of it the next day. We planned to drive separately across the country, but we still didn't have that much space in two sedans. As I kept reminding her, I asked her if she had anything unnecessary that would take up too much space in our cars. She would only say she had everything handled and we had plenty of time, but I had been getting anxious over her inaction. I mean, she really seemed stuck in this place. That is one of the reasons I love her, a sentimental nature. She really appreciates what we have, and this place we lived in is part of that. But this felt different somehow, like she actually could not let go, and this place was feeling hard for even me to leave for some reason. Which was stupid. I mean, I wanted to move. I was ready. We were ready. And it was my OCD that propelled me to go through her areas and belongings while she was out for her friend's birthday dinner. At least, that's what I told myself. Surely there was a part of me that was investigating. She had been acting strangely. That part of me that suspected something. Enough to snoop grew into my full astonishment when I found it. It was some sort of gem, or crystal, the size of a baseball and smooth. I'm no expert in that sort of thing, but anyone could have seen it was uncanny. It was glowing a subtle reddish beam from its very core. Upon inspecting the gem further, I noticed some sort of runic text. It was beyond my abilities to decipher even Spanish let alone this. But it was then I started to feel I could understand, as if the runes were speaking to me. Calls of my name in a long-lost universal language that we all comprehend when heard. 
It was then that I panicked and dropped the gem to the floor. I dropped down next to it. I gazed upon the glow illuminating towards me. I panicked and pulled myself back towards the wall. I caught my breath and pulled a pillowcase off the bed. I wrapped the gem thoroughly so the gleam of the gem ceased to show through the opaque linen wrap. I staggered my way through the house all the way to the kitchen table and sat the gem atop it. I felt relieved upon setting it down for it had begun to feel heavy and so was the sinking feeling that now sat in my chest. I waited there at the table for her to return. I had no clue how I would confront her about this. She tried to call me as she was on her way home, but I couldn't answer. I wasn't ready to face this looming confrontation. She greeted me from a distance, sensing something was off. I bid her closer. That sinking feeling was dragging me deeper into the depths of what was covered in the pillowcase. I decidedly uncovered the gem, because I came up with nothing to say. What are you doing with that? She had asked. I posed the retort that I ought to be asking her the same question. That's mine, and you shouldn't have gone through my stuff, she had said and I became flustered and pointed out that she had been concerning me with her recent behavior. She seemed aloof and was scratching worse than ever, and this gem, this object felt wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be here. I told her I needed to know where it came from, and then she made me feel bad. She explained that it had been a family heirloom passed down for generations from mother to daughter, it was a precious item for her, and she had been worried I was going to try and convince her to sell it. I wanted to believe her then, but something just felt off. What about the glow of the gem and the runic text? She looked puzzled at the assertion. She referenced the gem itself, which now to my disbelief did not shine in the slightest. Furthermore, I failed to locate the runes I had seen before. Had I been beside myself, was I hallucinating something this vividly? She calmed me as only she could. She rubbed my shoulders and played with my hair. I believe her when she said that everything was okay. She took the gem, which in her hands looked resiliently inert. For just a moment I was suspicious that the gem was hiding its true self from us, but she took my hand and led me to bed and I followed as one does. It was when she started scratching that night that the suspicion came back. I held her hands for a moment to stop her from digging into her skin. This time her temperature had seemed to rise, and her skin felt clammy. Her arms struggled as she attempted to scratch herself. This fit was the worst I'd seen. I knew then what I had to do. I waited until she was in the shower the following morning. I went back to her possessions where she kept the gem. The gem called to me as it did before. Its illumination felt like a familiar friend's embrace. The euphoria felt like her, a calming yet intense sense of belonging. But then it cut off, and everything I had been feeling was taken away, and I felt fierce annoyance, and it was consuming. Thoughts of paranoia followed, and my suspicions I had for the gem were gone. My eyes had turned to her. That night, I waited for her to sleep, and surely she began scratching, even more violently than before. And in that moment, I felt she deserved it. I went to the gem and basked in its call. The gem told me lies I perceived to be truths, and whispered ideas I had never thought of before. I felt frightened, but the gem reassured me. The gem wanted her for itself. She had found the gem here in the basement, and she had lied about it because she wanted to be with the gem too. As long as the gem could have her, I could have the gem forever. But this promise reminded me of a promise I had thought of making before. A promise of forever. A promise to her. I turned to her. She was clawing her skin. She was drawing blood in several areas. I felt the weight of every step as I went towards her, as if I were dragging chains, coupling bowling balls. 
The gem called me back, but I trudged forward. I had to get to her by any means necessary. The rays of the gem light brightened beyond vision. I blindly went onward. I instinctively outstretched my grasp, reaching for her. When I made contact with her, she was boiling over the pot with a fever. Drenched in her sweat, dampened t-shirt, and shorts. I had long since closed my eyes, but clenched them more tightly as I held her with all my strength. She shook rebelliously, attempting to scrape herself wherever she could reach. The gem amplified its call. A cackling resounded in the room, swirling with energy. I felt a heaviness leave my body and lightness took over as if my bones hollowed and I'd achieved some form of buoyancy. The firm grasp around her felt strained and she began to slip free. She scratched herself good and plenty in short bursts, blood ruining her nails. The gem hollered and heckled. I held on to her for all I could, and it felt as though hours upon hours passed before her heart rate slowed and her breathing steadied. The gem's volume faded and the glow subsided. I panted still as I held her late into the morning. She woke with a start that she had overslept, but I reminded her it was the weekend. I told her to get ready for brunch and to take her good time like she likes, because I had an errand to run. Again, I waited for her to get in the shower, and gross as I was from the day before, I threw on a hat and once again pulled a pillowcase from the bed. I sensed the gem had less power. Perhaps, during this time of the day, maybe its light could not outshine the glisten of the sun. It faintly called to me, a pinch of remorse in its tone. I wrapped it decisively. This was over. But it wasn't over. I brought the wrapped gem to my car and started up the engine. I noticed that the gem's call was slightly louder in the confined space of the vehicle. I rolled down the windows to let in some air. My plan was to drive to the nearest river where the county meets the city and chuck the gem to the very bottom. It couldn't bother us down there. I reassured myself. I calmed down and actually started to block out the gem's call. It tried to grow louder, but I held fast. I tried to remember her. I needed to picture her. But it distracted me just enough to miss my exit on the highway to the inlet of the river. I cursed, knowing I would have to progress forward through the toll road and into the tunnel. Traffic clogged up by the toll booth despite the electronic transponder payment lanes. I pulled through my lane at a steady speed and accelerated to pick up to speed at the tunnel when just then the truck in front of me slammed their brakes. I jerked the car to a stop just in time and just centimeters from the truck's tow hitch. The truck sped off as though not to be bothered by the event, and I proceeded onward. Once inside the tunnel, I began to have an uncomfortable feeling that the gem found something to be humorous. Could it be the truck I had almost hit? Was the gem somehow involved? I thought back to her scratching and scratching and decided the gem could have had some involvement. It was at this time that the gem started outright chuckling. I sped out of the tunnel and found myself unable to slow down as the gem burst out in a maniacal laughter. My foot felt like a bag of bricks pressed down on the gas. It was impossible to lift, as if glued to the pedal. I steered off to the side to avoid a collision. Drivers honked as I blew past them on the shoulder. The wind whipped my face through the open windows, which now made the chaotic chortling slice thin slashes in my face. The sound had left blood dripping from my cheeks. I looked off over the side guard rail where the river could be seen in the distance. It couldn't stop the car. I could make it go where I wanted. I ripped the steering wheel over as hard as I could and angled into the guardrail at full speed. The car flipped on impact and spiraled over the rail, landing upside down in the grass along the highway. I dangled a moment before coming around and unclipping my seatbelt. 
I dropped onto my neck and shoulders, crawled out of the open window. I coughed and my eyes stung from tears. I was apparently crying. I rushed around to the passenger side and saw the gem unwrapped. I grabbed it with little thought and made to chuck it in the river for good riddance. I cradled my arm back to catapult the gem and launched. In a swift motion, my body followed my fist holding the gem to the ground, for I did not let go. I yelled out and cursed the gem again. I madly stomped to the edge of the river and plopped in. I had to tread water here. I took a massive breath and dove beneath the surface. I swam downward intending to leave the gem at the bottom. But when I reached the sandy surface and placed the gem, I could not let go. Bubbles blew out of my nostrils and mouth as I lost my breath. I firmly placed my feet on the ground and pushed with all my might to launch upward. I ended up flailing in the water. The gem was pulling me down, laughing menacingly through the pressure of the water. It was here I blacked out into the darkness. I remember spitting up water on the grass next to the river. I looked around for my apparent savior and saw none. Then I remembered the gem. I searched the immediate area and there was no sign of it. I looked out at the river, wondering if I could have been successful in the dispatching of the gem. Did I really do it? Then the hair on my neck stood and I felt a slight itch. The call of the gem quietly beckoned me. I looked over my palms and shimmering across my skin was a familiar runic text. The itch grew on the back of my neck. I slapped it as one should. Just then reality set in, and from a distance a police officer called across the side bank of the river. A team of paramedics and other officers soon followed, and beyond them I noticed apparent witnesses. I spent the night in the hospital and will get off fairly easily with my clean driving record and a good lawyer. No one had been hurt and, besides the guide rail, only my property has been damaged. Community service and weekly check-ins with a therapist and I might get my license back one day. Or maybe I wouldn't have to worry about that. For now everyone accepted I had passed out at the wheel due to lack of sleep. I'd told them in my disorientation I stumbled off and fell into the river. Terrifying, but with the lack of casualties, not much of a police priority or a media buzz. But it was all fine as long as I could get back to her. And the next day I did. But things have changed. She was horrified upon my return, cradling herself on the floor. My first thought was the gem was still with her, like it was still with me. But her horrified state simply came from the current date. The last day she remembered was the day we moved into the house. The day she had apparently found the gem, I presumed. She'd spent the day I had been gone sobbing and figured she was seriously ill, perhaps dying. I calmed her and assured her we'd go to the doctor, that she would be fine. She asked for space, so I went to the couch. And now here I am collecting my thoughts, writing these events down, so maybe she can understand what really happened to her. As for me, I now feel the itch. It crawls across my skin in the worst of moments, and especially now at night. I've been applying lotion and drinking water, but this seems like the kind of itch that must be scratched. And so here I sit scratching, hoping she will believe me, while the runes shimmer across my palms. Maybe only I can see them. Maybe the call was always meant for me, because now it serenades me as I fuss over an itch that's been hard to scratch. If you are a local, I'm sure you've noticed the old yellow gas station has been closed for a long while. They say it was because of low revenue and vandalism, but that's a lie. I was there the night it was open. I know what happened. I know why the doors are chained shut. 
If you have driven the Mountain Loop Highway, then without a doubt you've seen the rundown little station on the corner of 20 and 530. And if you stopped by on a weekday between 5 and midnight, you would have been served by either myself or Iris. I was 16 at the time. Technically I couldn't work the hours that I was, but the owners were pretty relaxed when it came to certain things. Iris was two years older, and in my teenage opinion, simply beautiful. She stood equal to my 5 foot 8, had long dark brown hair that she kept in a ponytail while working, and the most mesmerizing blue eyes imaginable. It was the winter season. The pass over the mountain was closed due to snow. This meant we went from being nearly overrun by customers to seeing one or two people an hour. The later hours were even slower. Sometimes we would go the entire shift, only getting a single customer. During these times I would wander around bored out of my mind, or watch movies that I had downloaded at home. There was no cell service or Wi-Fi, so scrolling social media wasn't an option. Iris preferred to lean back in her chair behind the register and read books. I would try and make conversation occasionally, but it would always die quickly. The night of the incident was like all the rest. The sun had set depressingly early. We hadn't seen a soul in hours. I pulled my phone out of my pocket out of habit, realizing there still wasn't any service, I put it away. What time is it? I nearly jumped at the sound of her voice. What? I asked in confusion. She took her feet off the register and placed her book on it instead. Raising an eyebrow, she repeated, What time is it? Oh, it's... I had to pull my phone out again. It's 9.45. She sighed. We still got another two hours until closing. I just nodded dumbly. An awkward silence hung in the air for a minute. Iris picked up her book and continued reading. Feeling the moment slipping away, I blurted out, Hey, you want to do something? Like what? She asked without looking up from her book. I don't know. Something to help pass the time. As in? I just shrugged. She sighed and put her book down. Listen, Clyde. We're paid to keep an eye on things and help people buy stuff. Not to goof off or socialize. Her rebuke stung a bit. And it must have shown because... And it must have shown somewhat because she quickly followed with, Tell you what, go take the trash out and I'll check once again if the bathrooms are clean. Then we can inventory the beer cave together. I hated taking out the trash, but it meant we could do something together. Afterwards, it was worth it. Carrying the large black bag over my shoulder, I used my free hand to fumble with the bolt on the rear door. The doorknob never properly latched, so the owners had installed a large gate-style locking bolt. It usually required two hands, one to pull the door closer, and the other to rotate then slide the bolt back. Finally, working it free, I pushed the heavy metal door open. In front of me stretched a gravel driveway that led to the highway. At the end of the driveway was a worn green dumpster. Iris hated taking the trash out for the same reason I did. At night, there was a single light above the door. The rest of the walk was in near blackness. One night, I had stupidly bragged about how I didn't mind taking the trash out. How I kind of liked the fresh air. From then on, Iris had let me take it out every night. Willing myself forward, I walked out into the all-absorbing darkness. I felt eyes on me. Despite knowing it was just my imagination, I couldn't hold back a shiver. I lifted the dumpster lid and swung the bag inside. The lid slammed shut, echoing through the night. I almost didn't notice the rustling bushes just off the path. I froze. The sound grew closer. I nearly screamed as a figure stood from the blackberry bushes. Leaves and twigs sticking out of their hair and clothes, they took a step closer. I let out a breath I was holding. I knew that face. 
Jeez, Iris, you nearly scared me to death. Why are you in the bushes? She stared at me without blinking. Her eyes were completely void of emotion. She slowly opened her mouth. To death. She whispered in a voice that was not her own. Instinctively, I took a step back. She matched it with a step forward. Iris? She took another step closer. I. Reese. She whispered, despite her mouth being open too wide to be whispering anything. Fear coursed through my veins. Her enunciation was wrong. But even worse, it wasn't her voice. It was mine. My legs were beginning to shake. There was something wrong with her. Not only was it the way she sounded that freaked me out, but she looked incorrect. The color of her hair and skin was just a little off. Her dimensions weren't quite right. It hadn't been enough to notice at first, but the more I looked, the more off she felt. She spoke again, drawing closer with each word. Iris, to death. Iris, why, to death, Iris? The words were flat and emotionless. Each time she spoke, she sounded more and more like me. A car happened to drive down the highway. Her right eye jerked to the side, watching it pass as her left eye stayed focused on me. I snapped. I turned tail and sprinted for the building. Bursting through the back door, I slammed it shut behind myself and barred it. I slid to the floor with my back planted firmly against the door. I waited for something to happen, but the only sound was my ragged breath. Regaining my composure, I started to doubt what I had just seen. I don't know why she did it, but Iris had pulled one heck of a prank. I started to get mad. She had made a total fool of me. I could just imagine her out there doubled over in laughter. She probably even had a camera set up. I stood up ready to throw open the door and give her a piece of my mind when I heard her in the main room. About time you finished. What were you doing out there this whole time? She asked. Confused, I stood up. She couldn't see me in the back room. How did she know I was back inside? She spoke again. Are you going to come in or just stand outside? It was then that I heard my voice come from the room she was in. Iris, stand outside. Iris. Are you okay, Clyde? She asked with obvious concern. I heard her walk towards the front door. The voice that sounded like me encouraged her. Come outside, Iris. The inflection was still wrong, but it sounded so much like me. Realizing what was happening, I ran out of the back room. Iris, wait. I yelled. She jumped in surprise. Spinning around, she looked at me in confusion, then back to the empty front door. How did you... She trailed off. There's something outside. I don't know what it is, but there's something out there. She looked quite annoyed with me. Okay, Clyde. Work isn't the place for pranks. You got me. Now stop goofing off before we get in trouble. I glared right back. Listen, Iris, I'm not doing anything. And unless you were crawling around in the bushes a few minutes ago, there's someone out there messing with both of us. She didn't look entirely convinced, but apologized anyways. Sorry. I just assumed since it sounded and looked like you that you were behind it. You saw it? I asked. Yeah, well, you know as best as I could. These windows are so old they distort everything. We agreed to hang out together. So long as we could see each other, nobody could pull any more pranks. I was actually starting to enjoy the evening. For the first time, Iris and I were having actual conversations. I learned she was paying her way through community college and was an only child. I told her about myself and my plans for after I graduated. We talked about dream vacations and what plans we had for next summer. It wasn't too long before we had both forgotten about the night's previous incidents. 
I rested. I gotta use the bathroom. I'll be right back. While she was gone, I went over to the soft drink fountain and filled up a cup. Iris walked behind the register, picking up her book she began to read. You want something? I asked, holding up my cup. Before she could reply, something metallic clattered in the back room. Iris jumped to her feet. We both looked at the door marked employees only with apprehension. Stay here, she commanded. Before I could protest, Iris ran through the door into the dark room. A panicked cry came from the dark. Clyde? Just as I was about to rush through the doorway, a toilet flushed. I froze. Behind me in the bathroom door opened and Iris walked down. I felt sick. In the darkness of the back room, I could make out a figure standing just a few feet away. Iris noticed something was up. What's wrong, Clyde? I didn't take my eyes off the figure in front of me. There's someone in the back room. She ran up to me. What? She demanded. Who? Looking through the doorway, she gasped. You better leave. We're calling the cops. She yelled. The figure stepped farther into the dark, disappearing from sight. To death. Iris, came my voice followed by Iris's voice. Come here, Clyde. There was a pounding of footsteps as the figure charged us. I slammed the door shut just in time. An inhuman scream rang out as the creature slammed into the door. Iris and I held it closed as the door was assaulted over and over again. We didn't relax until we heard the back door slam shut. What was that? Iris asked. I didn't know what to say. This was too much. Iris jumped to her feet. I'm calling the police. I don't care who or what is out there. It just tried to attack us. I nodded. Yeah, that's a good idea. Iris went to the payphone behind the counter. She punched in 911, then held the phone to her ear. She hung up and tried again. She was muttering, trying a third time without luck, she slammed the phone back into the receiver. Clenching her fists, Iris groaned in frustration. The phone's dead, Clyde. I felt a knot form in my stomach. This wasn't uncommon. The phone was just as often broken as it was working. But it was really bad timing. Now what? I asked stupidly. Iris threw her hands up. How should I know, Clyde? This isn't exactly in the employee handbook. She slumped down in defeat. Hey, Iris? Yes, Clyde? We don't have an employee handbook. A small smirk played across her lips. I know we don't. With the mood successfully lifted, we went back to our original plan. We would stick together until sunrise. Then we would drive to town and report what happened. That was until a tattered, soft top, fox body Mustang pulled up to the pump. Uh oh, muttered Iris. We both cautiously peeked out the window. Do you think they're part of the prank? I asked. Iris bit her lip nervously. I don't know. I'm not even sure it is a prank. An old man slowly climbed out of the car. He was balding and wore thin, rimmed glasses. He reminded me of a short, portly teacher I had in middle school. The man fumbled with his wallet, completely unaware of us. After swiping his card, the man stiffened. He looked over his shoulder at something we couldn't see. Iris Doppelganger came striding into the light. Behind me, the real Iris let out a soft gasp. I was frozen in place. I stood there as that thing approached the man. Suddenly the doppelganger jumped impossibly high and landed on the man's shoulders. He collapsed to the ground under its weight. Iris pushed from behind me to the automatic doors. Her movement snapped me out of my daze and I chased after her. With the opening of the doors we could hear the man yelling out in pain. 
The doppelganger had long black fingernails that it was using to try and gouge out the man's eyes. Before we had even made it out the door, the second doppelganger rushed from the dark. It still looked like me, but more battered and dirty. It held a large rock above its head as it ran towards the man. Raising the rock higher, it brought it down on the man's skull. Iris turned and blocked my view, but I still heard the crunch. It sounded like a watermelon landing on a sidewalk from a great height. Iris shoved me back inside. Once the doors closed, she locked them. I chanced a peek outside. The car stood abandoned in the yellow light. All that remained of its owner was a thick red puddle leading into the dark surrounding bushes. Iris looked at me with tear-filled eyes. Clyde, I don't know if we're getting out of here. I didn't know what to say. We just watched someone die. My thoughts were a mess. I hugged her. We stood there holding each other, scared to death. Iris angrily wiped her tears. Come on, Clyde. We need to lock this place down. We pulled down the security gate and locked it in place, hopefully sealing off the front door. Not that it would do much good if something really wanted to get in. The windows on either side of the door were plenty big enough for someone to crawl through. The back door was locked, but for good measure, we pushed the baked goods display in front of it. We both froze at the sounds of footsteps above us. Iris covered her mouth to hold in a gasp. They're on the roof, she whisper shouted. We both looked to the access hatch that led to the roof. It was locked, but how sturdy was it? My heart lurched and a scream slipped out of me. At the front window was my face, blackened and grinning with its eyes open far too wide. No, it wasn't black. From the nose down, the face was stained with blood. It had been feasting. Iris jumped when I screamed. Seeing the face, she turned me and pulled me into a hug. Wrapping her arms around my head, she pulled it against her chest, blocking out my view of the thing outside. Just don't look at it, she whispered. Don't acknowledge its existence. That didn't last. The creature wearing my image started tapping the glass. At first lightly, but with each tap, the force increased. Soon, the old glass pane was flexing under the force. I looked up at Iris. I saw in her eyes that she knew as well as I that the glass wouldn't hold. The second creature dropped from above to join the first. Cracks began to appear. I was frozen in place, but Iris sprang into action. She managed to move the display, blocking the rear exit all by herself. The window shattered. The creature stood there seemingly surprised by the sudden destruction. Iris came from the supply closet. In her hand was the broom we used to sweep the floors at the end of the shift. She snapped the head off, leaving a sharp point. Iris had a look to her. It was as if time itself slowed in respect. She took my numb hand and put her car keys in it. She shoved me towards the back door. I stumbled into the back room. I looked over my shoulder to see her charging across the store. Improvised spear held out in front of her. The creatures were coming through the window. Their faces twisted with hatred and hunger in their eyes. I made it out the back door. I made it to her car. I made it home that night. As soon as I had service, I called 911. I bawled my eyes out as I tried to tell the operator what happened. They heard enough. Someone had died at the gas station, and someone else was in danger. The next morning, the police came to my door. They cuffed me and drug me out of the house. I spent hours getting brutally interrogated. Finally, I was able to go. From what I picked up, the officers arrived to the scene. The body of the Mustang owner was mostly consumed and laying next to the store. Inside there was bloodied hand and footprints everywhere. Iris was nowhere to be found. If it wasn't for the fact that there was no DNA evidence pointing towards me, I would probably have taken the blame. 
We moved within a week. Despite the charges being dropped within a 48 hours, the court of public opinion had determined I was guilty of murder, and probably worse when it came to Iris. It's been seven years now since they closed that station. I drove past it yesterday. I had to take that route for my job. The windows are boarded up and the blackberries have taken over half the building, but it didn't feel empty as I drove past. Thank you, Iris. You were braver than I could ever hope to be. I hope you can see what I did with my life and be proud. I miss you. I'll be taking the long way home. The extra four hours of driving is worth not having to go past that station again. I want to share this recent experience I've had. I can't find anything when I search it up, so as usual, this is my last recourse. For some background, I'm a college student. Not really that social. I don't go to parties or anything. I get chronic migraines and the music tends to set those off. Campus is pretty nice. It's decently big and it's got a lot of trees, so it's not like I'm inside all day. I'm staying on campus over the summer because I've got to retake organic chemistry, so it's relevant, I swear. The other day, I think Tuesday, I was headed back to my dorm after class, got unlucky and got saddled with it in the evening, so it was a bit hard to see, but we aren't an unsafe campus or anything. We have streetlights and all that. I don't get freaked out walking because the main danger is cars, and I have eyeballs and a brain. There had been this awful smell by my dorm hall for like two days before this, like somebody dropped a dead rat in the bushes or something. I didn't really want to go fishing around for a dead rat for obvious reasons, so I just ignored it. Come Tuesday, the smell was the worst it ever was. It smelled like somebody baked it. Finally decided I had enough of it around then, because I wasn't putting up with the smell for another week before campus cleaners got to it. Yogurt cups on the windows are one thing, smelly dead rat is another. I went to my dorm, grabbed a trash bag and a flashlight, and went back outside. I swear to god the smell got worse during the five-ish minutes I was in the hall. I waded into the bushes, waving my flashlight around looking for whatever died in a hole in there. Nothing. Couldn't find a thing. I checked the gutters. Nothing. Seemed to be coming from a dorm room that was by the bushes. None of the ones on the outside wall where you can basically just look in the window and see everything. So I decided to go knock on their door because I'm not the type of person to resort to calling the RA without trying diplomacy first. Just don't have it in me. I tried to go back inside the dorm hall. Buzzer didn't work. It didn't register my ID no matter how many times I scanned it. Naturally, I'm freaked out by now. I have homework and also all my stuff is in the dorm hall. This was an issue back at the start of the semester. IDs just stopped working for some reason, and campus police had to scramble to fix it. Seemed reasonable that they could fix it again, so I decided to pay them a visit. I turned to head over there, and I just see this massive... thing. Gotta be at least eight feet tall. It was hunched over like some kind of gremlin thing. I don't really know how to describe it. It was just... blank. There was nothing. No features beyond being vaguely human-shaped, but it was way stretched. It didn't have eyes, no mouth, no body features. Didn't have hands either, or feet. Didn't have on any clothes. Nothing to make it clear that this thing even has bones or flesh or anything. Looked like a rock, kind of. Except rocks don't smell like a dead raccoon that's been left under a trash can in the sun for five days. I just kind of stared at it for a while. Can't tell if it saw me. 
it eventually started coming my way and I think I nearly died of a heart attack when it did. But it walked right past me to the dorm room I wanted to check out. Went in through the window. Didn't even open the thing. It just squeezed through like it's made of liquid or something. After that I just kind of stood there for a bit. I didn't know what to do. How do you even react to that? There's a big thing that smells like a corpse and then it goes into your dorm hall through somebody's window. You try reacting to that. After that I went to campus police. They were completely unhelpful. As expected. ID wasn't even broken. So I wasted 10 minutes of my time for nothing. I went back towards the hall and nearly tripped over some random object in the road. When I tell you I almost threw up, I mean it. There was an arm in the road, just a whole arm rotting away, worms crawling in it and everything. I almost tripped over an arm. I accidentally squished one of the worms that had crawled away from the arm when I stumbled, and good lord that thing was full of just... grossness. That thing was leaning out the window of the dorm hall, same window it squirmed into the dorm hall through, and it was just there, leaning out with its head pointed at me. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, everything smelled like rot. I thought I was going to die. And then it just went back inside like it was never there. Window was shut the whole time. So anyway, I'm staying at a hotel now. I've already involved local authorities, so I'm hoping this gets resolved at some point. Still want to know what that thing was, but the only thing coming up is those nightcrawler things, and it wasn't one of those. There haven't been any missing person reports recently either, which makes things even more confusing, because that arm was still pretty fresh, even though it smelled like a five-week-old pizza. Not sure what to do. And the thought of going back to campus at all makes me want to curl up and die. I figured I'd share this here, since everywhere else is a dead end. Ever since I was a young boy, I would wake up in the morning with my furniture arranged differently than when I went to sleep. Sometimes it was small like my lamp in the wrong place, or my shoe rack was tipped over. Other days I'd wake up and the bed would be in the wrong spot. The dresser on the wrong wall. My desk in front of the door. In the beginning, it wasn't in a messy fashion. It seemed like a perfectly normal way to arrange my bedroom, just in a different way than I preferred. I have a very early memory from around five years old of my mom yelling at me for moving around all my furniture at night. I swore up and down that it wasn't me. She seemed conflicted when she was yelling at me. I wasn't a troublemaker. She knew it wasn't something I would do, but looking back now, I think she was just as scared of the thought of it not being me. After a couple of hours, I convinced my mom it wasn't me. After all, I was a small kid. I don't think I could have physically moved it on my own. Next to blame was my older brother. He was 11 at the time, so it still would have been hard for him to move my stuff, but not impossible. My brother liked to mess with me. No more than any normal brother, but never any over-the-top pranks. Mostly just because he was lazy, though. No way he'd lose sleep over something so weird like moving my furniture every night. After my brother denied it, and adding on that he stayed at his friend's house for sleepovers often, gave him an alibi. My mom attempted to blame my dad next, but of course, that comment was not taken lightly, and ended with my parents just pointing fingers at each other. My mom spent that night with me in bed. She tried her best to explain why she was sleeping in my bed without making it sound scary, but I could tell she was scared. I wasn't scared at all because it felt normal. I see now as an adult why she was freaked out. The night felt normal. If anything, it was a fun night. Like a big sleepover. My first sleepover, even. 
We woke up the next morning and my mom gasped and gripped the sheets. Wait, how did this happen? I was right here. My mom looked around the room. It was pretty easy to do so given that the bed was right in the center of the room. This hadn't happened before. It was always in a normal spot against the wall. It was like the room was showing off that it could put the bed in the middle of the room without us waking up. My mother always claimed to be a notoriously light sleeper. She said she can't fully turn her brain off in case we need her in the night, but she always seemed to sleep deeply to me. The rest of the day she kept insisting that someone was sleepwalking or something. She didn't think anyone was playing a prank, but she knew someone in the house was doing it. She had to believe it. My parents ordered a security camera online to put in my room so they could watch the footage the next morning. They got next day delivery, so I'd have to go one more night without them being able to watch me sleep. That night, they decided to let me sleep in their bed. I was even more excited than the night before. Now this was really a sleepover. That night, my mom tucked me in tightly in between her and my dad. I remember she held me all night long. I woke up the next morning to my mom sounding terrified. My parents' bed wasn't even in the bedroom anymore. It was sitting in the living room right outside my parents' bedroom. My dad sat up and started to get as concerned as my mom. How... how did our bed get out here? He whispered with a stutter. It can't even fit through the door frame. Was it taken apart and put back together out here? He hopped out of bed and picked me up into his arms in the process. We all stared at it confused. Even as a young boy, I knew something was really wrong. My dad started to take the bed apart to bring it back into their bedroom and noticed that the screws were loose. Some were even missing, like it was put back together in a rush. I remember my parents being on the phone with, I think, the police, but they never showed up. I remember my mom being upset on the phone when they wouldn't help us at all. That night, my dad installed a camera into the corner of my bedroom. My mom once again slept next to me. The camera they got was basically like a baby monitor that recorded the night. My dad had the monitor beside his bed to be an extra set of eyes. The night came and went. My mom and I woke up with my room yet again rearranged. She looked up at the camera to see that it was destroyed. All video from the night was destroyed as well. This was right around the time when baby monitors could record to an iPhone and you could watch the video the next morning, but everything about the video was corrupted. My family went to the police station that night, insisting that someone was in our house. The cops wrote down a statement, but that's all that came of it. My parents for the next couple of years kept trying to figure out what was going on, trying different solutions to find out how this was happening, only to find dead ends over and over again. My mom started to believe the house was haunted, and after a couple of years, my dad believed her. This was the main reason for our move when I was eight. I was so excited to be done with whatever was going on. At this point, the sleepovers weren't cute. I wanted my own space. My parents didn't let me go to summer camp or stay at friends' houses like my brother did. I was sick of it. It was night one in the new place. It was only about 30 minutes from our old house. Not too big of a change, but just enough that I was excited. My parents felt so good about the new place that they let me sleep in my own bed. I remember they told me at dinner while we ate McDonald's over a makeshift table made of cardboard boxes. I jumped up and down and hugged them both. That night, I got tucked in and my mom was hesitant to leave me in my own bed. She seemed worried but knew I needed this. My room didn't have much in it, just my bed, dresser, and a few boxes with my clothes in them. I remember falling asleep that night and thinking how creaky the new house was, but I didn't mind. I was hopeful. I woke up the next morning before my mom and dad. I didn't have curtains yet, so the sunrise woke me. I sat up and stretched. 
I rubbed my eyes to wake myself up, and I immediately felt a knot in my throat. The furniture was moved. At that moment, I made a decision. I knew if my mom saw this, I'd be stuck sleeping next to her for my whole life. My little imagination took over, and I thought about coming home from my job one day as a grown man wearing a suit and my mom still tucking me into bed. I sprung up and quickly moved everything back to where it came from. Luckily, nothing was too heavy for me to move. Just as I got everything back into place, I heard my mom's footsteps. I jumped into bed and pretended to be sleeping. She cracked the door and let out a sigh of relief and shut the door. How I wish I could go back in time and tell my mom the truth. I spent the next month doing this same routine. My mom always woke up at 7.30 to check on me, so I'd always get up at 7 and fix everything. It was exhausting, but worth it. My mom was warming up to the idea of me going to summer camp, so I was motivated. My mom got comfortable enough to send me to camp. It was only a one-night camp that year, which was fine. She needed to take baby steps. I didn't think anything would happen, honestly. But when we woke up in the morning, every single bunk bed was outside. All 20 of them. 30 kids and 10 adults. All waking up feeling confused and disoriented. Some bunk beds, even on their sides, tipped over. Of course, the camp counselors were confused. I knew what I had to do. I gaslit all the adults into believing it was the plan of the troubled kid, Eddie. I made up a whole story about how he convinced the other kids to do it in the night. I didn't think it was believable, but I was so convincing that everyone believed me. The camp counselors wanted to inform all the parents when they came to pick up what happened. Of course, it was a violation and needed to be explained to all the parents what happened. Luckily, I got out of it. I went to the camp with a school friend and his mom picked us up. His mom believed me when I said I'd tell my mom myself. As the years passed by, I realized no matter where I slept, this would happen to me. I turned it into a sleepover trick. I'll tell my friends to come over and sure enough it would happen. I'd even sleep at their houses and it would happen. Whenever I was trying to show off the trick, the room would be in even worse condition than a normal night. It felt like I had a superpower. The years went by and it just became my life. It was like brushing my teeth in the morning. Now and then I'd forget to fix everything in the morning and my mom would check on me. It only happened a few times, but each time I saw fear in her eyes. I always just said I moved stuff around the night before because I was bored of the layout. I could only use that lie so many times though. One time in high school, I was very sick. I was having a hard time getting up in the morning to move my furniture, and I didn't move my furniture for a couple of mornings. My mom was getting nervous, and I knew I had to get up before her to move it the next day. My mom came into my bedroom to say goodnight, and let me know she'd been done in the early morning, but would say hi as soon as she got home at around noon. This was music to my ears. I could sleep in and not worry about moving everything before she could barge in. The morning came, and I got to sleep until about 11. I couldn't believe how much better I was feeling. I knew I should have probably started to move my furniture and be proactive, but of course that's not what I did. I could hear my brother in his room next door playing video games, so I went to see what he was playing. Him being my brother, he wasn't letting me play with him, so I instead stood by his bed for way too long and annoyed him. I lost track of time and heard the garage door open. My heart sank. I ran back into my room and tried to move everything back into its place. Luckily, throughout the years, I convinced my parents to get me lighter furniture. They never caught on and it made life so much easier. Everything got replaced except for my dresser, which was a family heirloom. It wasn't all that big, but this day it felt heavy. I knew I was weak from being sick all week, but I couldn't believe how heavy it was. It was the last thing to move, but it just wouldn't budge. I frantically ran to my brother and told him I needed help moving my dresser. He leaped out of bed to run to my room. 
with most things. He doesn't care to help me. But I was always honest with my brother that the furniture thing never stopped. He knew that if our mom knew, the whole house would be a living hell and she might even make us move again. He always had my back when it came to my supernatural furniture. Instead of going back into my room, I went downstairs to distract my mom. I knew she'd be mad to see me out of bed, but the consequences of my furniture being out of place would be so much worse. My socks slid across the hardwood floor, and I reached the kitchen just as she was opening the door. Her happy humming was immediately interrupted when she made eye contact with me. She set a grocery bag on the counter and got out some soup she just bought at the store. I thought she was going to yell at me, but I wasn't going to question it. I figured she was being patient with me since I was sick. Just as she got out of a box of popsicles, I heard an awful sound. One that I will never forget. A sound that is completely my fault. I heard my brother scream. It was a loud scream, but short, like something interrupted it. It sounded like he stubbed his toe and then covered his mouth halfway through. My mom and I made eye contact and started to head upstairs to check on him. It was too loud to be something small. We turned the corner into my room and I didn't know what to feel. I saw my dresser still not in its normal spot, but just slightly moved from where I left it. The dresser had a big drawer on the front that opened like a door or a cabinet and it was wide open and empty, but most importantly, my brother was gone. An hour went by and my brother was nowhere to be found. The doors to the house seemed to be all locked. Same with the windows. We ended up filing a missing persons report. A whole week went by and there was no sign of him. My mom thought my brother was in the middle of moving my furniture to prank me or something and got spooked and ran off. I didn't have the heart to tell her, or anyone, that I felt like this was my fault. I thought that maybe whatever was moving my furniture wanted just me to move it or something. After that awful week, we found something to make it so much worse. My dad was in my room with me and trying to ask more questions about our last interaction. A lot of people ask me this since I was the last person to see my brother. As I explained it to him for the 100th time, he was randomly looking at the dresser and opened up the big door we originally found wide open. It had a note taped to the inside. Before my dad took it, he looked nervously at me asking if it was mine, but he very well already knew the answer. We called my mom into the room before we read it. The following is an exact quote from the note. I see our little game of hide-and-seek did not end like I imagined. Your brother is not who I intended to find me, but he will have to do for now. We had no clue what the note meant, but that didn't stop it from sending shivers down my spine. At the very least, now we knew someone had taken my brother. We thought the cops would do more to help now that we had a note. Well, they did do a little more to help us find him. They never found anything else. I never saw my brother again. Last year I moved out of my parents' house. The decision was completely based on my not wanting to move my furniture around every morning. I couldn't imagine a world where I could leave my furniture as is and just sleep in without the worry of my mom seeing it. That being said, I moved out as soon as I could afford it. I moved in with my best friend and we shared an apartment. He knew about my little party trick and was never too freaked out by it. Although part of me was scared that once he saw it was legit, he would be scared. The first morning I woke up and the room was a mess. Everything was in the wrong place just as usual. Although I didn't think there would even be a usual for how my room looked anymore. I was sick of fixing it. It was going to look however it wanted to look. After a couple of days of just letting my furniture do whatever, I noticed that it was being arranged more and more chaotic. Messier. Like the furniture was mad that I wasn't putting it all back. 
I started straightening things, but nothing too wild. I'd just leave the big stuff. I mean, my roommate was weirded out, but he didn't care at first. One morning, about two weeks into living at the new place, I woke up with my bed on our deck outside. I knew it was starting to get out of hand. The whole reason of me moving out was to not have to move my furniture around like crazy. I was so mad I couldn't just leave the furniture as it was. For some reason, it had to be put back to its normal spot. I let it go one morning. I wanted to see what would happen if I just left it, just once more. I woke up the next day in the middle of the woods with no clue where I was. I felt like when I was a kid and this happened with bunk beds, but this was so much worse. It was relatively easy to find my way back, but just a long walk. In all, it took me about two hours to get home, not to mention having to figure out how to get my bed back home. When I got back, my roommate had a chat with me. He said how he never really thought the weird furniture thing was real, and thought it was a very elaborate joke, and now that he lived with me, it was affecting his mental health. He felt paranoid and really tired and wanted me to move out. I was of course bummed, but knew it was for the best. I tried to tell him I'd start moving the furniture back every morning, and it would all be okay, but... That didn't seem to help him feel better. I called my parents to tell them I was coming back home. They seemed excited to have me come home. They seemed very cheerful, actually. When I asked them what was making them so happy, they said they felt better than they had in years and felt so well rested. It felt nice to hear them happy for what felt like the first time since my brother went missing. I had most of my stuff packed up and was ready to move in just a couple of days. We both knew this whole moving thing might cause problems for our friendship, so we wanted to do something fun before I moved out. We did a spontaneous week-long road trip. The morning I left, I didn't move any of the furniture back. It didn't seem necessary. I noticed something strange about the road trip. At no point in the trip did my furniture move. It was the first time since I can remember I woke up with everything looking the same. I thought maybe I found some kind of weird hack. We got back from an amazing trip feeling closer than ever, feeling thankful that we did it. I walked into my room and saw everything just as I remembered leaving it the day we left for our trip. Everything except for my dresser with the front facing down right in the middle of the room. I went over to the front of it to try and lift it into place, but it felt heavy. I immediately felt the memories of the day my brother went missing flash back into my head. This thing being heavy is bad news. I wasn't sure why, but I knew I didn't like it. I called my roommate in to help me move in. At first, he was hesitant. He didn't want anything to do with my furniture. Finally, I convinced him to just help me lift it quickly. As we pushed it back up to the wall, the body of a man came falling out. He was dead and limp. Claw marks filled the inside of my dresser. It looked like it fell over while he was hiding in it. He most likely fell over at the beginning of our trip and couldn't get out. He was in the same spot where I found that ominous note a little while back. He also had a gas tank that had a sleeping aid in it that was connected to one of those things that go over your mouth and nose before surgery or something. He looked malnourished and sickly. This man was my ghost for the last 15 years. Moving my furniture around, thinking it was some kind of fun game or something. This was the man who took my brother. This was the man who gave a sleeping aid to me and everyone else I lived with so he could move my furniture around for me. This was the man who took away countless sleepovers from my childhood. This was the man who stole my mother's peace of mind my whole childhood. So I could have some sick game every morning. They never found out who he was. They couldn't find anyone that matched his fingerprints or dental records or anything at all. It's like it never even existed. Most of all, they never found my brother. They never found out how the man got in and out of my house, if he even left, or how he was always around no matter where I slept. 
they never figured out how he managed to sneak around my living space for so long and not be seen. That was last year, and after that day, my furniture never moved again. They didn't deserve that. They don't deserve that. I don't deserve this. No one does. The thing is, I was never close with my parents. I mean, I loved them and had no problems hanging out around each other. We just were never close, you know? There was always a distance that we never bothered to close. So, when I moved away to uni, I didn't look back. There wasn't even much to look back to. My hometown wasn't even that. It was just a collection of small houses that had happened to be built at the intersection of two roads. I mean, sure, our town appeared on the map, but that's just because they had to put a name there. It was a nowhere place with nothing of worth, except my family. University was hard. I mean, obviously it was hard academics-wise, but the change from living amongst the same seven families my entire life to a city with hundreds of thousands gave me whiplash. But still, I thrived. I clawed my way up with everything I had to escape from where I had come from. Even though some of my peers doubted me, and others whispered trailer trash behind my back, I proved them wrong. I was better than them, not through some trust fund, but through my own hard work. I tried at every opportunity to forget my past, including leaving my parents behind. When summer break came around and I had no other plans, I decided that I would visit home. I don't know why I decided to go back. It's not like I had any reason to suspect anything was different. I hadn't even messaged my folks in the eight months since my mom's birthday. I just found myself making the long drive back home in the midst of a summer heat wave with nothing but empty fields in every direction. Anyway. I eventually arrived just outside the boundary separating my town from the endless farmland and had to slow my car to a halt. There was a concrete barrier blocking the entire road from being used. The only thing indicating that the road stopped so abruptly was a sign posted on the top of the barrier. Dead end. I had to drive into the ditch to get around the blockade, somehow getting my car stuck in the process. I swore to the sky, and was reminded how much I hated this place. I should have taken that as a sign to leave, to think that maybe the barrier was there for a reason, and that someone knew. Someone had to know. Still, I pressed forward, determined to not let this awful place get the better of me. The town was quiet. Not a single sound other than the wind chimes and some faint noise carried by the wind. It had always been quiet, but somehow, I knew it was different. There were definitely more trees in the front yards of my neighbors than I remembered. I also noticed that there was what seemed to be an empty ambulance parked in front of a house at the other end of the street, silently sitting with its doors open and its sirens off. When I let myself into my old house, the only sound that I could now hear was the static from the old radio my dad used to listen to the news with. The faint aroma of lavender also filled my nostrils. It wasn't dark in the house. Quite the opposite. It was bright. Every curtain was opened, and every light was turned on showing how dusty the house had become. It also meant I could see everything. My father sat in his old reclining chair, facing out to the backyard with his back to me. It was almost right out of a greeting card. If not for the shallow wheezing, I could hear from him. When I rushed over to make sure he was okay, I saw the front half of his body. It looked like his skin had melted in the chair, rooting him in place, unable to move. Thin tendrils made of flesh and muscle stretched out of his feet in front of him covering the carpet in a slick, bloody flower bed. Every inch of the front half of my dad's body bloomed outward, stretching into the sunlight to try and get as much nutrients as possible. His skin burst open from what looked like boils, 
unfolding into petals and pastels. Some sprouted out of his orifices, growing and growing and growing, grasping for the sun outside the window. I puked and I screamed. I thought my dad had died and I had not even known. I wish. When I looked at where his eyes had been, between the skin leaves and throbbing bulbs, I saw him looking at me, and I saw fear. Those eyes that I had tried to even forget the color of begged me for help, no matter what had to be done to stop the pain. I ripped at the flowers and roots, trying to get him free, but his flowering skin shuddered and he squelched out a small muffled moan through a throat full of flowers. It had hurt him. It hurt him to simply be alive. I fumbled to find my phone in my pocket to dial 911, but it didn't seem to go through. All I heard was the dial tone and the faint sound of wind chimes on the other end of the line. I looked around the rest of the house to try and find something to help him. I tried the bleach under the kitchen counter, but that only seemed to pleasure the flowers. Searching in the dining room, I saw a lighter next to my mom's birthday cake now rotting with small blossoming flies sticking out of the fuzzy frosting. It wasn't long until I found what I assumed was my mother. She was outside in the back garden grimly enough. She had grown into a sprawling tree, her bones splintering into branches that stretched into the sky, her bark scabbed over, dripping with sap and pus. She resembled a cherry tree with raw pink wounds budding into flowers. She was also alive, for however much I wish it weren't true. She managed to even stutter out, telling me to kill her. No one could help. Every one of my neighbor's houses held the same thing. Now seeing the trees outside for what they really were, I rushed past every house I could, hoping and searching for anyone to help me or my parents. There were dozens of flower beds littering the lawns, with flowering arms reaching out in the sky asking for help and sunlight. One of the most disturbing sights was the playset that the Evans had owned, now wrapped in vines. One of my neighbors, who I think was named Ted, had it worst. It had taken me a while to find him, as he was in his basement at the time, it was dark and fine particles obscured the effects of my phone's flashlight. Still through my coughing and blinking to get the dust out of my face, I eventually found what was Ted. What is Ted? He had collapsed into a heap of flesh, nothing being able to take root in the concrete floor of the unfinished basement. The flowers that covered him had wilted and shriveled, gangrene and necrotic tissue covering his entire body. He didn't even have a face anymore. His eyes unraveled into white lilacs and his tongue uncoiled into something similar to a grapevine. Every part of it blossomed to try and uselessly grasp at the sunlight that was not there. I think it hurt him to be away from the light more than it hurt the others inside it. I didn't care. I had come down to Ted's basement for another reason, and I had found it. I snatched the gasoline and ran back to my parents' house. It took me a while to thoroughly cover the house with enough for me to be certain, using up the entire can and praying that someone else would come along to help my neighbors. Then I used my candle lighter to set my childhood home on fire, waiting and making sure that my parents were thoroughly burned. The wind chime still rang as I heard the willow tree that we had never planted behind the house weep. It was as I started to walk away, certain that the house was thoroughly burning that I tripped over my own foot. When I looked down, I saw that my shoe had split open, with thin tendrils digging into the grass beneath me. I scrambled to try and get up ripping the thin strands of nerves out of the ground in excruciating pain, but before I could do anything, I realized my back was now leaching into the ground as well. Every movement I made to try and get up only pulled on my nervous system, 
shooting pain worse than anything I've ever felt through my body. Even as I coughed up blood and felt my throat expanding, I couldn't do anything but sit there and cry. Pastules have started to appear all over my body, eagerly waiting to pop and embrace the sun. It hurts to breathe. The insides of my lungs have bloomed already and scratch at every breath. My throat is full of roots and petals, so I can't even call for help anymore. I've managed to type this, though. The roots in my hand may have burrowed into my phone, but it has worked long enough for me to do this. I'm glad I could help my parents. I will soon bloom and smell of lavender. I hope someone comes soon. Someone must know. Whether it's the CDC or the government. Someone has to prune me or I will grow into a meadow. May 9th, 2024. Hey guys, I'm not usually the type of person to ask for advice on the internet, but I don't really know what to do right now. I don't want to be like one of those recipe pages where they tell you their entire life story before actually getting to the recipe. But in order to help me, I think it's important to get some background on my situation. I met my roommate, we'll call them Cameron online. I know what you're thinking. I had kind of signed up for some weird rooming with some rando. The reason I resorted to finding someone online instead of asking a friend is that A. I don't have a lot of friends. And B. The few friends I do have either want to live alone or live with their partner or family. So I didn't really have a choice. And C. I'm not really in contact with my family right now. I would live on my own if I could, but I'm currently working as an intern and barely make enough to scrape by. This is how I ended up on the Looking for Roommates in Their 20s Facebook page. Cameron messaged me first, and I thought it was really weird that they didn't have any Facebook friends nor a profile picture, but I thought the polite thing to do was respond. However, we got to talking and it seemed like we had a lot in common. We both are okay with clutter, as long as it's not gross, i.e. moldy food or poorly unkempt bathrooms, or hygiene, and loved cats, horror movies, and time to recharge on our own. Cameron told me that they specifically made their Facebook page to find a roommate and isn't really interested in having a social media presence, which is why there is very little info on their page. I can respect that. Sometimes I wish I never got my first Facebook account at 13 and relished on restricted internet access. Cameron said that they were just moving into the cities this year from a small farming town up north and was a little nervous about living in the cities for the first time. After talking more, we decided to meet up in person. We agreed to meet at a small diner halfway between their current home and mine which still ended up being a two-hour drive. They had gotten there first, and when they stood up to greet me, I was stunned as they did not look how I expected them to. Cameron was tall, muscular, and incredibly attractive. Their pale blue eyes seemed to glow in the dark, and their teeth lined up as straight and uniform as a military cemetery. I found myself jealous. As my eyes were dark brown, and not the pretty dark brown like puppy dog eyes, like sewer water brown, and never got braces when I should have. After I got over my initial shock, I bustled my way over to try to cover up my reaction. We shook hands and sat across from one another in an old booth that seemed incredibly worn but still felt welcoming. We discussed our desired living situation, how many bathrooms, did we need a dishwasher or in-unit laundry? Was AC necessary? Are we okay with pets? Rent budget and neighborhood we wanted to live in. Cameron appeared to be the perfect roommate. Agreeing with everything I said, I was looking for in an apartment. 
I readily accepted their offer to move in together. We found the perfect apartment and started moving in two months after we first started talking on Facebook. Neither of us had much, so we were able to move all our things ourselves without having to rent a moving van. Our layout looked something like this. Our bedrooms were linked with a Jack and Jill bathroom that had plenty of space for two people to keep their things and get ready at the same time. The front door opened up into the living room with the closet containing the washer and dryer to the immediate right. The kitchen was to the left and there was a small island between the kitchen and living room. I already had two cats, Seymour and Audrey, that Cameron was very happy to live with. At first glance, it seemed like we were going to be great roommates. Okay, sorry for rambling. I just want to show that everything was normal at first. Our lives intertwined seamlessly. I left for work before they got up, and they got home when I was starting to get ready for bed. We would occasionally eat dinner together on the weekends and play video games and watch movies and stuff, and sometimes go out for a beer. That is how it was for the first five months or so, until I noticed the hole in my bedroom wall. I saw it after I started to hang things up on that wall and noticed a small chip in the paint. I inspected it, as I did not notice it when we were filling out the form with all the damages from before we moved in, so they wouldn't be counted when we got our security deposit back. As I looked at it more closely, I saw something that reflected off my lamp for just a second. I got my phone to use as a flashlight and spotted a small, round, black object that was no bigger than a peppercorn. The hole was too small to reach in with my fingers, so I started searching for things small enough to grab whatever it was. I tried everything I could think of. Tweezers, toothpicks, tape, pliers, cotton swabs, you name it. Eventually I gave up and just went to bed. I couldn't sleep that night. All I could do was stare at the ceiling and think about what it could be. After a few hours of tossing and turning, I decided that if I couldn't get it out, I have to make the hole bigger. I wasn't too worried about the security deposit, since the hole was already made. What difference does it make if it's just a little bit bigger? I didn't have any tools, so I dug around until I found a small pocket knife that my grandpa got me as a souvenir from Alaska. It said, in all caps, I love my grandpa. I slowly made the hole bigger until it was enough to pull the object out with my tweezers. I celebrated as soon as I got it out, until I realized what it was. It was a pin camera. I only recognized it because I worked as a tour guide for a spy museum one summer. My mind was blank before the sirens in my head started going off. What was this? Who put it here? Is the landlord watching us? Was there a person living in the ceiling that only came out when we were gone? My brain reeled with possibilities, mostly related to situations in different horror movies I had seen. I had just watched 13 cameras last week, but one thing was certain, I had to search the apartment for other cameras. I just have to wait until Cameron is gone. May 11th, 2024. Cameron is gone for the weekend visiting family. We had previously discussed that it would be okay to quickly run into each other's rooms if needed, like if the cats were going crazy or we needed to borrow something. I hadn't had a reason to go into their room yet, but I had to see if there was a camera in their room too. I didn't want to freak them out without evidence. I opened their door and was a little surprised at the lack of furniture. Cameron had a twin-size mattress on the floor without a bed frame, a small desk, and a wooden cutting board that they must have been using as a bedside table. There was nothing on any of the walls, no lamps, and no TV or computer that I could see. It was the polar opposite of my room. It looked like it was straight out of Howell's moving castle. I was relieved that I didn't have to move a ton of furniture or take things off the wall, though. I started on the wall next to the bathroom where mine was, and when I didn't find it, I started searching up and down every wall. 
Nothing. As soon as I started to walk out, I realized I hadn't looked in the closet yet. I went over and pulled open the sliding door and froze. The clothes in their closet were almost the same as mine. I closed the door and left. I was a little weirded out, but we had a similar job and we never saw each other wearing anything other than pajamas or sweatpants, so I chalked it up to a coincidence. Anyways, I left their room and softly closed the door. I leaned against it and took a deep breath, half relieved and half terrified. It was good that Cameron wasn't being targeted, but that meant that someone was watching me specifically. May 21st, 2024. After our last conversation, I'm pretty sure it's Cameron. The next Saturday that we were both home, I decided to bring it up. I brought them into my room and showed them the hole and the camera. They said, What is that? That's messed up. But his face showed little emotion. I suspected they were just in shock, as I was when I found it. Then I told them I had gone into their room. They became rigid and slowly turned their whole body at me, as if they were one solid being without joints or limbs. They stared at me and I felt their eyes in my soul as they blazed with an emotion I can't name. Fear, hatred, confusion, I wasn't sure. You went in my room? They asked coldly. I guess it was more of a statement than a question, but I answered them anyways. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that there were no cameras in your room so you didn't freak out and tear apart your room trying to find one. I didn't find any though, I guess they're only interested in me. I laughed, trying to avoid the fear that was striking its way through my veins. You went in my room? Uh, yeah. I was confused. This was something clearly stated in our roommate agreement that we could go into each other's rooms if necessary. Did you see anything weird in there? I just told you I didn't see any cameras. Don't worry, your room seemed normal. Okay. Silence filled the space between us. I stood under Cameron's gaze, feeling as though I were being dissected. Then Cameron flashed their 100 watt smile. Good, they said. I can help you search your room and the rest of the place for other cameras. We searched our apartment top to bottom. Nothing. While I was still on edge, I felt better knowing it was the only one. Maybe it was left over from a previous resident freak. I decided to plug the camera into my computer to see if there was any footage on it. Thankfully, it seemed like it was really outdated and had no data on it. I threw the camera away, but decided it would be a good idea to put a small camera in my room to see if anyone strange came in or out. I didn't think to tell Cameron about it since it was my room and it was a good thing I didn't. June 13th, 2024. After a few weeks of recording, I decided to review the footage. It was mostly normal stuff. Me on my computer, sleeping, cleaning, etc. That is, until the second week. The door to my room creaked open slowly and a large figure began to walk through the darkness. My breath refused to come out of my lungs as my heart pulsated. When the light turned on, I felt like I was having a heart attack. It was Cameron. They started by doing a quick scan of the room before opening my closet. They didn't do anything. Just stared at it, as if he was taking pictures with his mind. They did this all around my room spending the most time looking at the pictures of me and my friends and family on my desk. After a few minutes, they turned off the light and quietly left my room. After that, I really didn't know what to do or how to interact with them. I tried to keep it cool, but I could tell that I was acting weird. They didn't say anything about it and went on as usual. I decided to do some background research on them, something I should have done in the first place. I started easy by googling their name. I knew they didn't have a social media presence, but I still expected something to come up. A LinkedIn profile, a news article, a mention in a dean's list or something. 
but absolutely nothing came up. I thought maybe I didn't spell their name right, so I decided to look at their ID when they were in the shower. I quietly went to the basket in the entryway, where we keep our wallets and keys, and slid the ID out of its pocket and froze. Cameron's name was not the one printed on the ID. The picture was definitely them. The blonde hair and wide smile, but the eye color description said B-R-O, not B-L-U. I looked closely at the picture and realized that instead of their piercing blue eyes, it looked like the person in the picture had brown eyes. I quickly took a picture of their ID and put everything back as I found it and escaped to my room. I decided to google the name on the ID. Sure enough, a fair amount of information popped up. Whoever this person is, seems to be a carefree and easygoing person with lots of pictures of them with friends and family. I sighed in relief when I clicked on the Facebook profile as it was public. I started from the bottom and scrolled through their posts. Most of it was the normal stuff. Happy birthday wishes, memories from years prior, pictures of them at events and stuff. I couldn't help but notice their eyes. Again, they were not that piercing blue that I have come to know. They were brown. Like a puppy staring at you with unconditional admiration. I didn't think that Cameron wore contacts, and I never saw any in our bathroom. The final post was dated two years ago. It said, Can't wait to move into my new apartment. My new roommate Cameron is the best. Posted with the update was a picture of the person with the brown eyes and another person that I did not recognize at first, until I noticed their piercing blue eyes. Cameron's eyes. I have no words to describe what I was feeling at that moment. My heart sank so deep into my body. I closed my laptop and stared at the wall, my thoughts coursing through my head so fast that it felt like I wasn't thinking at all. I decided to just go to bed. June 15th, 2024. I usually try to write these a few days after stuff happens, but I'm not even going to have time to proofread this because I am typing as fast as I can. Cameron is outside my door right now, banging on it. I just want to document this and post it because I think I know what is going to happen to me. I opened my door a few minutes ago and saw myself standing outside, but this copy of me had those piercing blue eyes that I have become to fear, and I knew in an instant that I had to document my experience as fast as possible, because I don't know how much time I have left. If you're seeing this, tell my friends I love them, and that whatever it looks like I am doing in the future is not me, and to stay away, I wouldn't wish this on anyone comments. Update. Hi. I know it has been a while since I posted this, and I have to say I am very embarrassed about it. Turns out our apartment had a carbon monoxide leak and I was hallucinating. I am out of the hospital now. Thankfully Cameron was at work when this happened and came home to find me passed out. I'm not very internet savvy, so I'm not sure how to edit or delete this post, but I did figure out how to comment. I just wanted to update and reassure you all that I am okay. I have decided to move back to my hometown to spend time with my family, to take my mind off of things. Cameron is sad, but understanding, and is looking for a roommate. Attached below is a screenshot of their Facebook if you are in the area and looking for a roommate. Image description. Screenshot of a Facebook profile. The picture is of a man in his late 20s with messy brown hair, slightly crooked teeth, and pale blue eyes. The account has no friends or posts. I found the job listing online. It was vague, but intriguing. Assistant needed. $1,000 a week. No experience necessary. 
I was desperate for money and the pay was too good to pass up. I applied and got a response almost immediately. Thank you for your interest. Please come to the following address for an interview at 8 p.m. tonight. 8 p.m. was an unusual time for an interview, but I didn't question it. I arrived at the address, a nondescript office building in a deserted part of town. The lobby was empty, and I took the elevator to the fourth floor as instructed. A woman in a dark suit greeted me as I stepped out. She introduced herself as Miss Allen, and led me to a dimly lit office. She asked me a few basic questions, then handed me a contract. Welcome aboard. Your first task begins now. I barely had time to process her words before she handed me a black envelope. Take this to 1423 Willow Street. Do not open it. Leave it in the mailbox. I nodded, my heart racing. This was odd, but I needed the money. I took the envelope and left the building. 1423 Willow Street was an old, rundown house. I hesitated, then slipped the envelope into the mailbox as instructed. As I turned to leave, I heard a faint whisper. Thank you. I spun around, but no one was there. Shaking, I hurried back to the car. The next day, Miss Allen called me. Good job. Now for your next task. She instructed me to pick up a package from a storage unit and deliver it to an address on the outskirts of town. Again, I was not to open it. I arrived at the storage unit and found the package easily. It was a small wooden box, oddly heavy. I placed it in my car and drove to the address Miss Allen had given me. The house was isolated surrounded by dense woods. I left the package on the porch and was about to leave when the door creaked open. An elderly man peered out, his eyes cloudy and unfocused. Did you bring it? He rasped. I nodded and hurried back to my car, unnerved by the encounter. Over the next few weeks, the tasks became stranger. I delivered more packages, picked up mysterious items, and even stayed overnight in abandoned buildings. Each time, the instructions were clear. Follow the rules exactly. Do not ask questions. One night, Miss Allen called with a new task. Go to the old cemetery on Elm Street. There's a mausoleum in the center. Enter it and place this candle on the altar inside. Light it, then leave immediately. I arrived at the cemetery just before midnight. The air was thick with fog, and the only sound was the crunch of gravel under my feet. I found the mausoleum and pushed open the heavy iron door. Inside, the air was cold and stale. I placed the candle on the altar, lit it, and turned to leave. As I reached the door, I heard a low moan. I froze, then bolted out of the mausoleum and didn't stop running until I reached my car. That night, I couldn't sleep. The moan echoed in my mind. The next morning, I found a new envelope under my door. Final task, return to the mausoleum and retrieve the candle. I didn't want to go back, but I needed the money. I arrived at the cemetery just as the sun was setting. The fog was even thicker than before. I forced myself to enter the mausoleum and found the candle still burning on the altar. I picked it up and a chill ran down my spine. As I turned to leave, the door slammed shut. I was plunged into darkness. My phone buzzed in my pocket. Welcome to your new home. Panic set in. I pounded on the door, but it wouldn't budge. My phone buzzed again. You shouldn't have taken the job. Watch out. I stared at the message, my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. The air in the mausoleum felt heavy, pressing down on me. I tried to call Miss Allen, but the call wouldn't go through. My phone buzzed again. There is no way out. Desperation set in. I felt along the walls, searching for any kind of escape. The stone was cold and unyielding. 
I banged on the door, screaming for help, but my voice echoed back at me, the sound swallowed by the darkness. Suddenly a soft light appeared in the corner of the room. I turned to see the candle I had picked up, now floating in midair. It began to move, tracing a path along the floor. I followed it, the flickering light my only guide. The candle led me to a small, hidden door at the back of the mausoleum. I pushed against it and, to my surprise, it opened with ease. I stepped through into a narrow, dimly lit tunnel. The candle floated ahead, illuminating the way. I followed the tunnel, my heart pounding. It seemed to stretch on forever, the air growing colder with each step. I could hear whispers, faint and indistinct, coming from the walls. They seemed to be urging me forward, but their tone was menacing. Finally, the tunnel opened up into a small chamber. In the center was a stone altar, and on it lay a book bound in worn, cracked leather. The candle floated above the book, casting eerie shadows on the walls. I approached the altar, and saw that the book was open. Its pages were filled with strange symbols and cryptic writing. My phone buzzed again. Read aloud. I hesitated. Everything in me screamed to turn back, to escape this nightmare, but I felt a strange compulsion to obey. I took a deep breath and began to read the words on the page. As I spoke, the air around me seemed to vibrate. The whispers grew louder, more urgent. The symbols on the page began to glow, and I felt a cold swirl around me. The candle's flame flared up, casting a blinding light. When I finished reading, the light disappeared, plunging the chamber into darkness. I felt a presence behind me, something cold and malevolent. I turned slowly, my heart in my throat. Standing there was a figure cloaked in shadows, its eyes glowing a sickly green. It reached out a hand towards me, and I felt an icy grip around my heart. My phone buzzed one last time. You have freed me. Now, you belong to me. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The figure stepped closer, its grip tightening. I felt my strength drain away, my vision darkening. Just as I was about to black out, the grip loosened. The figure vanished, and the chamber was once again illuminated by the soft glow of the candle. I collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath. My phone buzzed again, and I shakily pulled it from my pocket. Congratulations, you passed the final test. Your service is no longer required. I don't know whether to feel relieved or terrified. I stumbled out of the chamber, the candle guiding me back through the tunnel to the mausoleum. The door, which had been firmly shut, was now open. I stepped out into the cool night air, my heart still racing. I drove home in a daze, not fully comprehending what had happened. When I got there, I found a package on my doorstep. Inside was a letter and a stack of cash. Thank you for your service. This is your final payment. Do not attempt to contact us again. I looked at the money, then at the letter. It was over, but the feeling of dread lingered. I knew that, no matter what, I would never be free of the memories of those nights. The whispers, the figure in the dark, and the final chilling words stayed with me. And sometimes, late at night, I could still hear them. Watch out.